Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Hey, hey, folks, it's Shay here, and today we are visiting with Chad Tentinger, and we are going to be talking about Legacy Beef Co-op and Cattlemen's Heritage. A majority of our conversation today is about how these two companies are working together to create more synergy and profit within the beef supply chain. Now, when I say that, I mean more synergy between the rancher, the feeder, the packer, and the retailer, and the consumer, because everything we do, we are creating a high quality product for the consumer too, right? With that, there is also a lot of conversation about how this synergy creates a profitable model for all segments of the industry as well. So if you are curious about different ways, or maybe you've already been exploring different marketing opportunities for your calves in the future years, this is definitely one episode that you will want to prepare to soak up every second of. With that, let's visit with Chad. But one quick second. One of the best ways to help other people find your favorite podcast is to leave a rating or review on your favorite listening app or share it with a friend. Remember, after you're done listening, help me out. Give me the rating and review and share it with a friend. That way, more people can find this content because if you're finding it valuable, it'll probably help someone else too. All right, now it's time to visit with Chad. Well, good morning, Chad. It is a pleasure to have you on the show this morning and I'm excited to talk about everything that you are doing because you really have this strong background in agriculture and entrepreneurship, but what you're doing now in the beef industry is just so up and coming, innovative and needed. And so I'm excited to have that conversation. But before we dive in to that part of the conversation today, would you please share a little bit about your background in agriculture and kind of what led up to you starting Legacy Beef Co-op and Cattlemen's Heritage? Well, thanks for having me this morning. I'm excited to talk about the message and make sure that uh, everybody knows what we're talking about. So um, one thing before I go into that of what I my background is, you know, our whole goal here is just make sure as many people understand what we're trying to do as possible. So I appreciate the opportunity to reach out this morning. So I'm a fourth generation cattle feeder myself. I uh, still feed cattle to this day, a lot of cattle, um, right here in northwest Iowa. I grew up around Claghorn, Marcus, Rems, and Iowa, up in the northwest corner. Uh, farmed with my grandpa when we were kids. We farmed with my grandpa, my dad, uh, and my brother. So today, my parents live on the home place, uh, which we started feeding cattle on in the late 1800s. And we still feed cattle here today. Um, my brother has a farm outside of Claghorn, which was the farm I grew up on. And I have cattle feeding facilities around Marcus, Cherokee, the region in general. So tied into this business my entire life. Uh, my nieces and nephews are in the business. My children are, some of my children are in the business, some are not, as, as you can imagine. But we're family farms. We're tied to the root of family farms. And uh, my entire career has been a balancing act between I want to farm, I want to row crop, I want to feed cattle, but I had to find a means to do that and we started construction company, cattle feeding facilities, we've done a lot of things in the cattle industry, but I've been doing this on the construction side through various companies probably for close to 20 years now. And what I've realized, especially in the last few years after starting Cattlemen's Heritage and Legacy Beef Co-op also, is really everything that we do it is a cattle company tied to family farms. Our whole goal with all my companies is to keep families on the farm better than we have in the past, right? So something that I talk about that I'm sure if anybody's watching anything I've ever talked about, I tend to throw this in, but it's, it's so near and dear to the heart of me. When we were kids growing up in the eighties, the farm crisis, everybody knows about it, right? So there's two kind of farmers in the farm crisis, the ones that made it through barely and the ones that didn't, right? I mean, there was nobody that came through it successfully or better off. And we were told not to farm. We were told there's no future in it. There's no way you can get into it. It doesn't make sense. Um, 
I think me and my brother were just honored enough. We decided we're going to do it and we found ways to do it. But at the same time, here we are 40 years later and we're telling our children that there's no money in this business where there's unbelievable money in this business. We just have not figured out a, a model that allows us to participate in that money. You know, we as producers get to participate in every downside in the market and we don't get to participate in the upsides. So, you know, long story short is I don't think it's acceptable for us to tell our young men and women that this isn't a business you should be in if you want to. You should be in this business. We just have to create the business model that works for us. And that's a big part of what we're doing today. I think that's a very important point to bring up because I know I had people tell me that as well that you know there's no money in it go do something else if you're going to do it go be a researcher go get your PhD go do something like that and that's not what I wanted to do but I see a lot of people who create or find the right business model for them so I appreciate you saying that now can you explain on the basic level what Cattlemen's Heritage is and Legacy Beef Co-op because they're tied together. And if you want to flip-flop that, how you explain it or which one you explain first, that's fine. But let's have you explain it on a basic level because we'll go into more detail later on. Yeah, I think it's all surrounded with the core belief that we need to realign the industry around a model where the producer earns a share of brand profits and receives a more favorable pricing and delivery model. I mean, that's the core of it, that together we are better and we need to realign our industry to work for the cattle feeder today because in the last 10 years, what I've watched is the CME, the Board of Trade, the live cattle futures, does not trade on fundamentals anymore and does not represent what our animals are worth. We have a system to do that. The box beef, choice box beef index is every single day of the week, tells us what our product is being sold for, at least the boxes are sold for. So we believe we should be tied to that. So Cattlemen's Heritage is uh, the company that is building a processing plant outside of Council Bluffs. That packing plant will be 2,000 head a day on a day shift, state-of-the-art equipment. It is designed because of the technology in it that we will operate $100 a head cheaper in production cost than any other plant in the system today. That's a very important point to make. You know, you can't go take an old plant and try and figure out how to make it more efficient to the same scale as what we're doing. Cattlemen's Heritage is a model that is producer driven. Um, we'll have 20% ownership of the producers, which will be the co-op, Legacy Co-op is the group of uh, cattle feeders that will supply their cattle to go to the plant. They will own 20% of the company. It's important to point out the company because Cattlemen's, one of our goals is to tell our story. You know, the story of every cattle feeder in this country. It's a great story. I mean, I believe we have one of the best stories in any industry to tell and nobody's telling it, right? Young men and women working every day on their farm, working every day to create uh, more to pass down to their family. I mean, it, it, and we walk into, we work with our family, we work with our friends. I mean, this is an amazing business and it's a great story. Nobody's telling it. Cattlemen's Heritage is going to tell this story. We are going to talk about the family farms. We are going to introduce the family farms to the consumer. This is a very, very important part of it for me. So we're going to tell our story to the consumer so that they know it. So that will create a great brand. We are going to brand this product. This product then, you know, will be Cattlemen's Heritage, right? So through the branding, the producers will own in that branding. They will own in every part of it. So when the brand makes money, we as producers make money. When we sell our cattle at the front door, we make money. When we sell it out the back door, we make money. Legacy Co-op will deliver the cattle to the plant based on the choice cutout box beef index. That's really important to us. That gives us at least a fundamental that we're trading on. Then we'll take out cost of production and we'll split profits at that point. That's the whole concept. So you deliver on a favorable grid tied to a fundamental in the market. You also get a $25 bonus when you deliver. 
which is a pretty big deal. So right off the gate, you're getting more than you would have. You're getting a better pricing model. You're going to share in the profits. And then when we sell out the back door, when we sell our product and create a brand, you share in all of that. And keep in mind, what we share in today, we share in our box beef, right? That's what we get part of today. Well, there's a lot of this animal that makes money, right? There's the rendering, there's the drop, there's all that value being created that we don't participate in today. In our model, we will participate in all of it. So the co-op is designed to sell our cattle into Cattleman's Heritage. Cattleman's Heritage is designed to create the most value for that product possible and share it with the producer. So all we're talking about is two companies working side by side that have each other's best interest at heart so that we can work together as a team to create more value for our producers. You know, one thing that we see in our industry today is we see the, the insurance companies moving in pretty rapidly into our, this space. Well, insurance companies, that's great, but if you're gonna buy insurance on an animal because you don't trust the selling mechanism, well, doesn't it make more sense to change how we sell our cattle? Because nobody's buying insurance to protect against the box beef index. You're buying insurance to protect against the free fall of the market. The funds trade differently than we trade. We have to protect ourselves. So for the cost of insuring an animal, you can buy a share into the co-op and just eliminate the idea that you're going to sell on the box beef uh, on live cattle index. So you made the comment earlier and I've seen it on some of your materials before too and that's, and correct me if I'm not quite quoting this right, but cattle producers are better when we work together. We are absolutely better. You know, one thing that the industry has done to date, I think, is make sure we're playing at odds, right? Me, I'm a Finnish guy, so I wanna buy my calves as cheap as I can buy them. So that automatically sets up a system where I'm working against ranchers in, in theory, and the ranchers wanna sell them as high as they can, so one of us, we're fighting back and forth for scraps, it seems like, when the money's being made on the next steps. Well, we need to work together as ranchers, as producers, and as packing, to make sure that we share in all the profits together, right? I mean, there's never an animal, there's never an animal that loses money on the ranch, on a backgrounder, on a finisher, and at the packing plant. There's, that never happens. So there's profit in the system on every single animal, and we need to work together to make sure we are partaking in those profits. One thing that gets me in trouble when I say it, but I think it's important to point out, today we are supply side. Once I sell my animal, I don't get a say in what they do with it, how much money they can make on it, what their profit margin is. And for me to say after I sold it that I didn't get a, I didn't, it was unfair. I didn't get to share in all those big profits. Well, I agree I didn't get a share in any of them, but I don't own the mechanism that made those profits at that point. I sold my product. My goal here is to say we have to take ownership because if all of us cattle feeders, work together, and if we were the majority shareholder of any company in the system today, we'd be pretty happy with the system. We'd be receiving those profits and we'd feel like we're being treated fairly. We, there is no mechanism that I know of in the system today that will allow us to work together to create a better product and to actually receive the product, the, the, the value of our product, right? Because something that our system has done today is the big companies in this country have done an incredible job to create more value for our product on the sales side. We, as ranchers and cattle feeders, have not done a great job in figuring out how to participate in those profits. Because I feel like on a day-to-day -day basis, we're being divided when we should be working together. Even on the finish side, you know, how many times have we all heard, well, you know, I'll buy your cattle for this, but don't tell your neighbor because they won't get, you know, I'm gonna pay them less or whatever. It creates that idea that we're, separate, we're in a separate industry working against each other. And we're not, we're not. What I get for my cattle does not impact at all what my neighbor gets for his. We know that, but for some hot reason, we try to believe that it does. So the ranchers, the backgrounders, the finishers, we should all work together. And you know, I always make a strong point to say, I'm not anti the big companies. They process most of the cattle in this country and they're gonna continue to process most of the cattle in this country for the foreseeable future. We absolutely need them to be strong and working hard 
at what they're doing to make sure we have a great successful um, model. All I'm saying is we'll be about one and a half percent of the production today. One and a half percent is our plant, our company. We will complement them. We, we're a niche market compared to that, but we're big enough that we can be on the shelves, we can get space on shelves, and we can share our profits. And hopefully, my goal here is to be somebody that shows a better version of the system, a better model for us producers, for, our, for the ranchers, that we can change industry over the next 20 years. That's my goal here. But we have to take ownership. If we as producers and ranchers and feeders and cattlemen, cattlemen and women, if we choose not to participate, we don't get to complain about the system we're in if because here's a better option. We have better options. They're available today. And that's that's one thing that I've said before, maybe not on the show, but just talking with other neighbors and family and whatnot. It's I hear a lot of people who, especially in past years, complaining about the price they got for taking their calves to the barn. But they didn't try to look for any other option or any other alternative either. So you are creating another option for producers. And I think that's exciting for our industry. Now you've talked about cattle producers, feeders, packers. What about the retailer? Where are you at with developing relationships with who's going to be buying the beef from your plant? Well, we have been contacted by a lot of companies around the world to buy this product that we haven't even gotten through a packing plant yet. So the demand is there before we even create it because they know the story, they want the story. We are in process of talking to multiple retailers in real time right now. Um, we will have a partner before the plant opens on retail. We'll have multiple partners, but it's all timing. Um, it's a great question. Why don't we have a retail partner today? Because we don't really think the best time to get a retail partner necessarily is before we can properly um, have a conversation about what the value of our product really is, right? I mean, you can always create contracts early that probably leave a lot of value on the table. Our goal is to make sure that we have a very strong value on the table and we wanna make sure we do that in time. So before we open our doors, we will have that all spelled out, but right now it's a little early to have a full partner on it. But again, it's at least 80 companies around the world have contacted us. And the reason they want the product is, there's multiple reasons. One is we have great high value product in our region, right? Cattle coming out of the West, coming into the, the upper Midwest to be fed. We have the best cattle in the world already at our fingertips. So they want that product. That's a high in demand product. We also have a great story. We're gonna tell the story of the family farms. The consumer wants to know where their food comes from more and more every day. We're gonna tell them, you know, we're going to put the label on every one of our packages will probably display the fact that this is a made in the USA product, right? We don't have to have the governor, government or somebody else tell us to do that. We're gonna very proudly do it ourselves because we can prove that every ounce of our product is a US product, so that's a big deal. So that'll be part of it. The other thing is, because the way we feed our cattle versus more in the South, but certainly in the North where we are, we use all of our fertilizer from the manure of the cattle. We reutilize all these value products and we have a much greener footprint. Now I know that can be a dirty word in some circles because we don't know what that all means, but I will tell you this, I don't know what a consumer will pay for a greener steak today. You know, that's probably not the best way to say that, but, but for a more environmental friendly steak today, but we know we'll have it. And if they're willing to pay more, we have the product to give them, right? The way we feed our cattle, I mean, they, on the ranch side, they're grazing on open ground. You can't get any greener than that. They come into our facilities. We finish them in the upper Midwest where Mother Nature provides all our grain. Our average feedstuffs come within 10 miles of our farms. We have a very small environmental footprint compared to other parts of the country. And we're going to tell that story. So we're going to have a green footprint uh, with a high quality product. So I tell you all that to point out this is a product that's in high demand that the consumers are asking us to create. One other point I'll make on that is when you start talking about creating a new plant, people somehow think you're creating more product. The product's already being sold today. We're not creating more cattle. We're not going to create more product. It's just going to come through a different plant with a better story, right? So the product that we're going to be making is all 100% sold today in the system. 
that demand isn't going down, it's going up. So the product, once we have it, once we have the brand identified, and which will be Cattleman's Heritage, but once we've really put the resources into branding and properly telling our story, it will be a high premium product. Now, one thing I like to point out there, after I just talked about all these value adds we have, it's important to point out the plant is designed, like I said earlier, $100 a head cheaper. It's designed, we can compete with anybody on a level playing field all day, every day. It's designed to do that. So if all we want to do is create products, sell at commodity prices, we will be successful. We don't want to do that. We want to create a premium product and that's what we're about, but we don't have to have the premium to make it successful. That's a very important distinction. If we don't know what a consumer will pay for environmental friendly, we don't know what a consumer will pay for sustainability. We don't know what a consumer will pay for traceability. We don't know what they'll pay for any of these things, but we know we'll have them all. And if the consumer will pay 10, 15% more, we'll be the only plant in the country ready to cash the checks. I think that's a pretty important distinction. And I think sometimes, I mean, you said it where sometimes people don't like to hear the word greener, more sustainable. I know it does turn away some cattle producers who don't like to have that conversation. But the reality is, like, we don't know if they'll pay more, but we do know it matters. Yeah. I mean, it especially for, like, the Gen Z um, generation, that sustainability piece, it does seem to really matter for that generation. Now, I want to take a step back and, you know, you've talked about it in pieces but say for example hey Chad I want to have my cattle go through legacy beef co-op and eventually end up in your plant what would that process look like for the cattle producer so for especially you know for the ranchers that would buy co-op shares today we're in the round of $150 a unit one unit represents one delivery obligation per year uh, that round will close shortly. We're selling in five rounds. Each round goes up $25 a unit. So we started at $125 a unit that closed. We're at $150 a unit. It will close soon. Immediately opening will be $175 a unit, then $200, then $225. Then $525,000 total units will be sold, which represents the total capacity of the plant, $525,000 a year. So again, for the cost of insuring cattle in the money, you can buy a unit that eliminates the insurance cost. So if you're a rancher, you buy a unit, you have two options at that point. You can uh, retain ownership of your cattle, partner up with a feeder that would finish them for you. We will have a list, we have an extensive list of custom feeders. We are growing that list daily. That's another part of what we do as a cattle operation. So if you choose to re retain ownership, you just finish it out, you deliver your animal, all that stuff we talked about, you participate in a grid that's favorable to the producer uh, based on premiums discounts, but it's tied to the box beef index, not an artificial gambling hall. That's a big one. You own in the plant and you get dividend checks. That's why you want to be part of this. Now, if you say, listen, I can sell my calf today, you know, because the cycle goes up and down. I can make really good money on my calf today and I'm satisfied with that. I don't want to take the next risk. Then that you would have the option to lease your share to a finished producer that would buy it. So then you would be selling your calf into the system with another um, partner that's with us in the custom feeding operations, and they would lease that share from you. And that would be a negotiated lease between the rancher and the producer. That has nothing to do with cattlemen's heritage because we're not part of that negotiation, but you know, you as a rancher, you own that share. What's the value? What's a fair value? Work with a producer, sell the calf, lease the share and figure out how to split those profits. Again, there's $25 bonus when you deliver your animal on a share. And if you go back for the last decade, what we have done all the data on, in our model, it would be, there's been about $210 per head of more value than the decade before created in the last decade that we as cattle feeders didn't participate in. So if you go back from 03 to 2013, that model worked at about 61.3% of the box beef cutout. We sold our cattle at 61.3% of the box beef cutout for a decade. Then you fast forward to the next decade, 04 to 4, 24, excuse me, 14 to 24. That time frame, we got backed up to only 55, 
roughly 55% of the box we've cut out. What that represents is another $210 ahead of value created we didn't participate in. Now we're not arguing that we as producers take all that money. What we're saying is there's true value of margin there that we need to work together and split the profits, you know, that work together. So if you own a share today, you will deliver on that share as a cattleman, or you will lease it to somebody to finish that animal. So as a cow calf producer, you get two great options with your animal to create more value for yourself. And you get to choose in the years you want to do it. Do I want to retain ownership or do I want to sell that calf into the system and lease the share out? What about producers who are typically trying to sell in selling program cattle, value added, whether that's like um, a tag program, an HTC, something along those lines, um, who have been, they've been trying to be proactive to find, get a better price for their animals. Are those programs still going to be an option if they're working through you? Or is that kind of what that $25 per head is to, in a sense, maybe make up for that? No, all those options will still be available, right? Because if there's more value to be made, obviously we want to participate in that. So we'll participate in all those programs. So the so the uh, cattle feeders that are part of those programs today that want to retain, maintain and be part of those programs, we'll have the same programs at the plant. Again, a grid just works on premiums and discounts, right? So you deliver high quality cattle that qualify for these programs, it'll all be there to be had, participate in all of it. Nothing about us is designed to, to have less value for the animal. Everything is designed to create more value and participate in the whole system. So when you're talking about the cattle that will be delivered, I mean, what, what type of cattle? Are you just talking steers and heifers? Um, or will you do any cold cows? Or like what, what are you handling? So cattle we're feeding today, right? Steers and heifers will obviously be in, in of all colors. All, you know, a, a grid works with quality. So when you deliver quality, you get a lot more premiums. Um, as far as cows, we would, we would anticipate we'd have to have some uh, cow kill based on just the idea that for the grind, you know, for the trimmings. Um, today, we're not signing up cows into the program based on we really don't know where the premiums would be generated on a cow kill. But you would have the option to bring your cows to us um, to have them processed, and we would still have a market bid for those. When you started this and were thinking about, let's say ranchers, you wanted to help, what is that rancher doing? What type of ideal rancher are you wanting to work with? I think all the ranchers doesn't matter how big or small a rancher is, how many head they have a year. I want to work with family farms, family ranchers, which they're all families, right? I mean, the majority of it. I know in the, in media, other sources, they try and uh, make us all big corporations and things like that, which isn't reality. Um, I want to work with them all. So the, I, anybody that's having that's in the cattle industry should be part of this co-op. There is value to be made by being part of it. So if you are in the cattle industry today, you should look at this co-op. So you said 2,000 head per day, correct? Yes. Okay. How are you going to spread out, you know, if you have all these co-op members, if a majority of them are, say, raising springborn calves, are you concerned about there being more of an influx during one time of the year compared to others? Um, are you going to have different delivery dates set? I mean, what's your plan there? Or are you just going to try and have it balanced out where it'll be more spread out through the year? That's a great question. So we will have 525,000 units sold, which represents our total kill outside of any overtime weekends. So we can obviously expand a little bit. The way we are going to handle the scheduling is we are selling 100,000 arbitrage units, which people in agriculture that really don't have the cattle to deliver are not going to deliver cattle, but still find the benefit in being part of a co-op. They will buy shares, and every time Cattleman's Heritage goes out and buys cattle on the market, open market from other co-op members or whatever it is, we deliver those arbitrage shares, we'll get a payment, that, that bonus structure that we've laid out. So that allows Cattleman's Heritage to have 100,000 spaces to fill our schedule throughout the year. 
So roughly 20% of our scheduling will be done through those arbitrage shares, and that's how we are going to handle that. Um, another thing to point out, when a co-op member delivers their cattle, one of the questions we get asked a lot is, well, what if you try and force me to deliver my cattle undervalued, you know, not paying as much? Great question, but if we go back in the last 20 years, that really would have only even been feasible for a couple months out of the 20 years. So the reality of it is what we're gonna do as a company is our floor in our grid, our pricing model will be the five area average. So there is no way that we can force anybody to deliver any of their animals under the value that they could have gotten in the open market any given week. Okay, we talked about what Legacy Beef Co-op is. We've talked about what Cattlemen's Heritage is and what each of them do, how they work together and how they create this synergy within all sectors of the beef supply chain. But who is behind it? Obviously yourself, but you can't possibly manage all of it alone <laughs> with as big of a project as this is and as much else as you have going on. So talk a little bit more about the other people who are helping make this possible. So we have a great team, right? You're spot on. When we started this a few years back, first thing we did was we hired some of the best advisors in the country. We went to a large accounting firm out of Chicago and told them to do a deep dive in the cattle industry for the last decade. Just a very renowned company did this for us with the one idea. Are we right? Is there more profits in the system? Should we, is there potential for us to build a company that can share in profits and everybody has, makes, still makes good profits and makes money? Is there enough to go around? So we hired that company first and foremost. They came back and said, not only will it work, it'll work extraordinarily well. And not only does it work, it's already existing today. There are, you know, two, 300,000 head feedlots in the country, very large feedlots that already have deals with certain packers that are sharing the profits. So once you understand that this, this model is working today, and once they came back and after doing a deep, deep dive in this to create a Performa, saying it works well, then we went to the next step. We started hiring more advisors. And so some of our advisors are, are uh, people that have um, been in this industry for 40, 50 years. Uh, they've retired out of the big companies. They're now you know looking for something to do. One thing this, this industry does well is a lot of the uh, executives retire in their late 50s and they're not done. <laughs> they're still looking for something to do. So the talent out there is amazing. So we, have, we are surrounded by an entire team, right? So I know I'm the face of it, but there's an entire team behind me working morning, noon, and night to do this of industry experts, um, of business experts, uh, accounting firms that their sole purpose is to make sure the numbers are right and they're accurate and it works well. We hired a company, Morel Equipment. They're the leading supplier of uh, processing equipment to design our plant to make sure it was the most efficient plant in the system. Um, so again, although I'm the face of it, this is, that's all I am. I mean, there, there's experts behind it. We had ideas. We asked people if they will work. They did the data mining. They prove it will work. We had the top engineers in the country design the plant. And when the plant opens up, we will have the top people available to operate it. You know, I think some things we've seen in the past where there's been people that have tried doing different things that haven't been successful, which we can go into detail on why they're successful and why they're not, but I don't know if that matters. What matters is if people step out of their role and think they can do things they can't. So a lot of people question me, well, can you run a plant? The answer is no. I will not be running a plant day to day. There will be absolute industry experts that have ran plants for 30 years running our plant. They will be the CEO. They will be the managers. This is, this is a very in-depth um, alignment of people that have the same ideas that we do are the same belief system that there's a lot of money in this business that it needs to be shared through the system. Talk about the economic impact you're expecting to bring to the area around where the plant will be. Well, in Iowa, because we'll be in Iowa, so we had Ernie Goss do a study for us. He's an uh, economist out of Creighton University, um, very well regarded in the space. 1.1 billion annual economic impact for the region. Uh, it's 800 direct jobs in our plant. It's 3,600 indirect jobs in the region. 
Um, and then that's just the plant itself. The brand, we believe, will be more successful than the plant itself, but we have to have the plant to create the brand. You know, when you think about branding, the billions of revenue that can generate backwards into our, into our producers is really staggering. I mean, we don't know what the top end of that will be, but we do know we'll have billions of dollars of year, a year economic impact on the region. That's big. I mean, at 1.5% of an industry, that shows you how big our industry is, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, again, it goes back to fundamental belief. We have got to work together as an industry. I think, I think for some reason we've been separated for too long or, or forced to think we're working against each other. We don't. We absolutely don't. We're, we're partners in this. Whether you are on the ranch raising that calf you are partnered with the guy finishing that animal because that's where the value is going to come from. I can't create value as a finisher if I don't start with good stock. It, it, you know, the, the, the family's mm -hmm. dropping the calves on the ground and that rancher can't receive more money for his calf if the end guy can't make money when he sells it. We are truly partnered this entire process through and we've got to work together. We've got to work together um, to own in the end production so we can create the value. And the way we designed this, by the way, we talked about the co-op and cattlemen's working together. Another question we get a lot is, um, you know, how, why, why should we trust you? Why should we trust cattlemen's over anybody else? Well, the reason you would trust us is it's designed to be dependent on each other. So cattlemen's heritage will have a nine person board, an LLC. The co-op will have a nine person board as a co-op. The co-op will have two members on Cattleman's board. Cattleman will have two members on the co-op board. In between there will be an advisory board of all board members working together to solve any problems that arise. It is designed that for Cattleman's Heritage to be a successful company, we want to create value using with our producers. With our producers, we want to create the most value we can for that product. Telling the story, creating the brand. The co-op members are dependent on Cattlemen's Heritage because we're the only ones telling, saying we will share in the value of that once it's created. You have ownership. You have a seat at the table when every single decision is made. So the reason you, you know, trust but verify, I guess you would say, the reason that you can trust us is because you are us. We're together at the same table working together. If we work against each other, the whole thing collapses, much like it is today. That's been a um, theme. I don't, well, I'm sad it's been a theme, but it gets talked about a lot on my show is how we, as cattle producers, sometimes tend to fight, especially ranchers, can sometimes fight against each other more than work with each other. And sometimes if, it's easy to catch the mentality that the world's out to get us. And I guess I have the fundamental belief that that is not the case. I don't think everyone is out to get us and that there are a lot of opportunities to be positive, find the right business model, market, whatever it may be. So thinking 15, 20, even 30 years from now, how do you picture the beef industry being different? I think, I mean, my vision is regional mid-sized plants like us, more of them entering the market space, um, working directly with the producer, supply working together hand in hand with production and ultimately we just by working together we create a better product right i also if this model is successful which it will be but when we're successful in our model i guess is a better way to say it i also see more family farms instead of less we've been in declining family farms since the 80s there's no reason for it the consumer is clearly telling us they want to know where their product's coming from. They're telling us that every day. If you go to any supermarket that has a story of a product, it brings a premium and it sells first. We just haven't done it in our industry. So how I see in 20 years from now, when we're successful, I see more family farms, more ranchers, more families staying in the business because I don't know of anybody leaving this business or this industry because they don't like the life, because they don't like the quality of the life or enjoy being out here and doing what we do. They leave because it's not financially viable. That's the only people I know that leave this industry, right? Mm -hmm. 
Well, if we change that, I believe we can keep more young men and women home on the farms, in the family business, working together with this great quality of life. And that's my end goal. I want more family farms. I want uh, more ranchers. I want more people in this industry working together that have the right attitude about the industry, right? For too long, we've given all our power away to big money that comes in out of nowhere that, that you know, they want to make money. Everybody tries to make a profit, but if all you're about is the profit, then you're not really about our industry, right? It's got to be about the quality of the product, creating a better product, telling the story of the product, and create more value for our families and our farmers. Um, if we don't do this, uh, you know, I I think there's going to be larger and larger industries enter our space, um, and it pushes more of us out. And I don't think that's a future any of us want to deal in. To your point about what consumers are willing to pay, I think the direct to consumer market, or even what Amanda Radke is doing with Bit on Beef, is a great example of how producers are willing to pay more for the story. And so well, I, think, I think it's a great example. The, the direct to market industry is doing very well, right? There's, a, there's more profit to be made and that proves it out. And in our model, if you really think about it, it's no different than that. We're gonna tell the story. We're gonna tie it back to the families. We just have a bigger processing plant instead of the local locker, we're coming through a bigger locker. There's really not much difference there. I, I talk about that a lot, even when you go to your local locker in town because you know you know who that meat came from or you trust that it's a better quality because it's local. We're gonna do the same thing just on a scale that gets us into all the markets. Because the one thing that we looked at a lot of, when we started Cattleman's Heritage as an idea, we wanted to, we looked at building a 500 head a day. The fact of the matter is at that level, it wasn't viable. It just, there, you can't get enough for your byproducts. You can't get on enough shelf space to make it work. So what we found is 1500 head a day is where it really works well. It didn't take much more to go to 2000 head a day. So that's where we landed. it. Um, and I think that's the, that's where a lot of the direct to market individuals have trouble with. When you're selling your product, it's in high demand, everybody wants it, and then you don't have enough of it. So it's hard to find that right balance between having enough product to make sure it all sells in a timely manner. And then when your marketing works and everybody wants it, can I create enough? In our system, it's basically the exact same mentality. We're just coming through a bigger locker and we have the ability to tell that story of where this product came from and why a consumer would want it. Do you see your business model creating more opportunities for producers who are smaller and say can't make that full load of steers? Yeah, we have we have co-op members that are delivering one load a year. We have co-op members that are larger delivering a lot. We have co-op members coupling together with neighbors saying, you know what, I've got 10, there's three other neighbors that have 10, we're gonna put 40 together on a pot load and deliver. We want everybody that wants to be part of this in. We're not putting a bottom on it. If you want to buy 10 units, buy 10 units. You want to buy 10,000, buy 10,000. There's no limits. But at the end of the day, when we're telling our story, when we're building our brand and marketing it, it will be a story about the 500 family farms that came together to create the best product on the planet. And that's what's on your plate today. That's a powerful story. I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the TV shows that people watch, you know, what the Yellowstone TV show that, you know, whether we all agree or not, Heartland yeah, yeah. I mean, became the most popular series in the country. So when people say, well, do people want to know our story? They desperately want to know our story. The cattle industry has the best story on the planet to tell. But if you don't work together, you can't tell the story. I mean, and the big, the big, uh, the big, uh, big companies in our industry can't tell that story because they're not connected to us. They're not us. Fundamentally, it doesn't work. What story can they tell? You know, they they have a product that they have to move a lot of and, and it doesn't benefit them to tell that story. But with us working together and having ownership in it, there's a lot to be said for a story. I mean, look at a company like uh, Whole Foods. When you walk down the, the grocery aisles at a Whole Foods and every item has a story and they're 20% higher than any place else and their product is moving as fast as they can move it. 
the, the consumer's desperately asking for us to tell our story and that's what we're gonna do. Before we wrap up the conversation, Chad, what final thought would you like to share? Final thoughts on today is, I think we gotta make sure that um, if you have any questions, just reach out, legacybeefcoop.com. Reach out to us. We wanna come out, we wanna sit down at the kitchen table, we wanna have a conversation. Call us, ask your questions. We wanna answer them. We want everybody involved. We want everybody to have the answers. There's a lot of speculation about what's trying to be done or what people think is gonna be done. Ask us directly and we'll tell you directly. We're easy to get a hold of. We're in the same exact business you are. We're probably the only guys out here that are in the same business you are trying to do this. And that's important, right? So reach out to us. Um, if you are in the cattle industry, you should be in this co-op. I believe that to my core, the power of this co-op on bargaining, buying products, selling our products, every single part of this co-op will benefit you as a cattle producer, no matter what stage of the game you're in. All right. Well, Chad, thank you very much for being on the show today and sharing your story. For those listeners out there, I will share links to what we talked about today down in the show notes. And remember, the best way to support this podcast and your favorite podcast is to rate, review, and share it with a friend. Happy ranching, folks.